to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Welcome to our study of the Genesis of the New Testament. Genesis 1-1 gives us an introduction to the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, which Genesis is all about beginnings. You've got the beginning of the world and everything in it. You have the beginning of mankind. You have the beginning of, of sin. You've got the beginning of God working towards salvation. Genesis is all about things that started for the first time, a book of beginnings. The New Testament also has a book of beginnings, and Acts could be called the book of beginnings for the New Testament. It is the genesis of the New Testament. No other book is of, of greater value for finding out how to be saved and understanding the work of the church than the book of Acts. Someone has often referred to Acts chapter 2 as the hub of the Bible. Everything before it is looking toward it. Everything after it is predicated upon what happens in Acts chapter 2. And so today we're going to examine some beginnings in the book of Acts. But before we do that, let's first place Acts in its proper setting in the New Testament. The New Testament has four stanzas, we might say. Matthew through John tell us about the life of Christ, who he was, what he did, and what he taught. These are referred to as the gospel accounts. The book of Acts then tells one how to become a follower of Christ, how to become a Christian. Then Romans through Jude tell us now that you are a Christian, here's how to live faithfully as a Christian. And the book of Revelation tells us how to die victoriously in Christ. Acts itself has a threefold purpose. The first purpose of the book of Acts and the main background to it is what must one do to become a Christian? Acts chapter 16 verses 30 through 32. That great question is asked. Many brethren, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts tells one how to obey the gospel and become a Christian. A second purpose to the book of Acts is it is the history book for the rest of the New Testament. If I open to the book of Philippians and I want to learn more about the church in Philippi, more about what went on there, I need to open to Acts 16 and study about the gospel coming to Philippi. If I open to Corinthians, I need to turn to Acts chapter 18 and get the background. And then thirdly, the book of Acts tells one about the establishment of the New Testament church, the one body, the one church that Jesus himself built. Now with those things in mind, let's think about some beginnings in the book of Acts. The first genesis is of a new name. You have the beginning of the new name that God now is going to call his people. I want you to notice the words of Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. Look at what the scripture says. The Bible says, and, we, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. For the very first time, you've got the genesis of that new name, Christian. It occurs twice else in the New Testament. Acts chapter 26 and verse 28, uh, here we have Paul preaching, and the, he responds by saying, Almost, almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Then in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, it occurs when Peter says, If any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. And so the name occurs three times in the New Testament, but this is the name God had prophesied would come. In Isaiah chapter 62, 
verses 1 and 2, the scripture promised that when the Gentiles saw God's righteousness, he would call his people by a new name. The gospel comes to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 10, Peter there preaches the gospel to Cornelius and his house. They hear words by where they can be saved. Acts 11, 14, and 15, no one forbids water and they are baptized. And for the very first time, the Gentiles, now in the New Testament era, see God's righteousness. Well, what name was it? Was it a denominational name? Was it a name that some man thought of? What's the name that Christians go by today? We don't name ourselves after some great religious leader like Martin Luther or Zwingli or uh, someone else. We wear the beautiful name Christian. Acts chapter 11 verse 26, they were called simply Christians first in Antioch. We're not hyphenated. I'm a such and such Christian. We don't put something above that name. It's the only name that God's people are given as far as by prophecy in Isaiah 62 verse 1 and 2. Well, someone says, okay, what's really in a name? What does it mean to wear someone's name? Well, what implications does that carry? It means that you're joined to that person. When we wear the name Christian, that implies that we have joined ourselves to Christ and that we have given our life in submission to Him. Galatians 3.27 teaches, As many of us as have clothed, have been baptized into Christ, have clothed ourselves with Christ. Romans 7, 1 through 4 teaches that our relationship to Christ is like a marriage. And 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, We are members of the body of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I wear the name Christian because I want to give Christ the glory and the honor and because I want to be like the person whose name I wear. Children often idolize heroes. They may want to follow certain heroes. Maybe it's someone they saw on TV. Maybe someone out of a comic book. Christians wear the name Christ because they want to idolize and they want to follow in his footsteps. 1 Peter 2.21, the Bible says, For this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, you have that, that grand scene, and it's the redeemed of all the ages, and the question is asked, who are these? These are they who followed the Lamb wheresoever he went. Acts 4 verse 13, after Peter and John have sternly rebuked the Jews for leaving Jesus out of their spiritual superstructure, the Bible says then they realized they had been with Jesus. Are we really giving God the honor and the glory by wearing the name Christian? What would you say? What would you say if someone asked you, what are you religiously? Would you say, well, I'm a certain one of this denomination, or I belong to this certain group, or would you say simply, I'm a Christian? Nothing more, nothing less, and we can feel the joy of being nothing more, nothing less than a child of God, a Christian. Well, as we think about what it means to wear someone's name, let's also realize that when we say that, we are admitting and giving ourselves to follow that person. When I wear the name Christ, I am submitting to His will and I am trying to follow Him. Joshua 24 verse 15, Joshua said, Choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. When I wear the name Christian, I am giving myself to God and I am saying, I am willing to follow you, Jesus, wherever it takes me. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Wearing someone's name also means that you're trying to glorify the name of the one you follow. 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God, listen, in this name. When I wear the name Christian, I am going and I'm going to give my life to God and I'm going to try to glorify Christ in everything I do. Did you realize that's what life is all about? Isaiah 43 and verse 7, God said in the long ago, Everyone who's called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. If we follow the name of God and the name of Christ, 
Our goal is to glorify Him. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, Paul said, Whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we must do all to the glory of God. That's what life is about. What's the whole purpose? So many people are, are going through life without real meaning, without real purpose. They're just taking a lackadaisical approach. What's life about? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing that we have. And so God is going to judge us, but I must fear Him and I must obey His commandments. And realize today, Christ is the only name. The name of Christ or the name Christian is the only name you can wear and be a faithful child of God. Why is that? You look to the scripture and you don't find other names, nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 that He is the only foundation, nor is there any other foundation. Christ is the foundation and the one whom we must glorify. Now let's make that real practical. In the New Testament time, the Jews were famous for having their sex. You've got the Pharisees who exalt their tradition and they go by Pharisee. You've got the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection and, and they go by the name Sadducee. You've got the Zealots. You've got others. And they had all these different sects. Were they giving God the glory and the honor? Not at all. And if people wear men's names today, are they giving God the glory? If I say to someone, I'm a Lutheran, who do I give the glory to? Martin Luther. If I say, well, I'm a Methodist, who am I giving the glory to? John Wesley. You see, friend, you can't be a hyphenated Christian. You are either a child of God, a New Testament Christian, or you're not. And names are important to God. Someone says, oh, you're just making a big deal out of names. Names really aren't that important. Oh, they are. God at times even changed people's names. He changed Paul from, from Saul to Paul. How, how would you like for your child, if you had a daughter, would you name her Jezebel? Would you name, her, would you name your son Adolf? Would you name him Judas? No. Names have a, a connotation, and they give honor and glory to the person wearing it and the person who gave that to them. Well, God gave us the name Christian. We give Christ the honor, and Christ wants us to wear His name. If the church is the bride, and Christ is the head, and we're the wearing the name Christian, how do you think it makes Christ feel if we wear some other name? About like it'd make you feel if your wife took some other man's name. You wouldn't like that at all. You'd be jealous. You'd think she didn't love you. And you'd think she wasn't committed to you. The same way Christ feels when we don't wear the name that God has given us. Well, there's another beginning in the book of Acts, and that is the beginning of gospel sermons. The key word here is the word gospel. Oh, there were many sermons of doom and destruction throughout the Old Testament. God had promised that if the people didn't straighten up and get their act together, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets preached a multitude of sermons. But in the book of Acts, we now for the very first time have the gospel being preached. The key word gospel means good news. Here's the good news. Notice Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. The Bible says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The good news is, yes, you may have crucified Jesus. Yes, that was against the will of God. But here's the good news. God has now exalted him to be both Lord and Christ. And you can have forgiveness of sins by obedience to the gospel in baptism. In this sermon, Peter has four main points that are rele very relevant for us today. He preaches that Jesus himself was approved by God. God placed his sign of approval on him by the many good works and deeds and miracles that he did. Jesus was predetermined by God. That is, in the mind of God, from the beginning of time, God had already decided 
his son was going to be a sacrifice. He then preaches about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, how this was according to prophecy, and how the, the tomb cannot contain him, and he's now at the right hand of God. And then he notes that Christ is ascended to the right hand of the throne of God, verses 33 through 35. And then he makes that great conclusion. This Jesus, he's Lord in Christ, and, and the people get the point. They realize they have now thwarted or tried to thwart the plans of God, but in so doing, God is going to work through that. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart, and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the demand is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Aren't you thankful to God today that we have that, that very first gospel sermon, that we can have the, the good news? Sin is bleak, sin is dark, and sin is sad. But the good news is Jesus tasted death for every man, and God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, and anyone who wills can obey the gospel. Revelation 22, verses 7 through 14. Then we find in the book of Acts, the beginning of immediate forgiveness of sins. Now we want to emphasize immediate. This is the genesis of forgiveness of sins occurring immediately. Now here's what we mean by that. Under the old covenant, forgiveness of sins was granted on the, uh, the blood of Christ. It was granted on the fact that Christ was coming. But the blood of bulls and goats couldn't remedy the sin problem. Notice the words of Hebrews 10, verses 3 and 4. The scripture says, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Imagine you sin. You go out to the field, you get that, that spotless lamb or that spotless bull, you take it to the altar, you sacrifice it, you skin it, you sprinkle its blood, it's cooked, and you can smell the cooking of it. Oh, the bloodiness that went with that. And then the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Do you see the blessing we have of forgiveness as immediate in Christ Jesus? Hebrews 8 and verse 12, God says, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. Psalm 103 verses 10 through 12, God there teaches us the power of forgiveness. God again promises that he will forgive sins. Though our sins are like scarlet, God says, I'll make you white as snow. Isaiah 1 verse 18. But what is it that brings salvation to mankind? No doubt, it's the sacrifice of Jesus. No doubt, it's the blood of Christ. But at what point do I receive immediate forgiveness of sin. Where are sins removed at? The Bible teaches sins are removed when we contact the blood of Jesus in baptism. The blood of Jesus is what saves. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And thus we contact Christ's blood at the point of baptism. Acts 2.38, they are told to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Now, we're not saying that's all a person has to do. You've got to believe. You've got to repent. You've got to make that good confession. But you also must be baptized in Jesus to receive forgiveness of sins. And here's the good news again. When we obey the gospel, when we're forgiven, we have reconciliation with God. You see, sin separates. The, the Bible says God's ears not heavy that he cannot hear, his arms not short that he cannot save, but your sins and your iniquities have separated your God from you. Sin severs that relationship. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, but in Christ I can be reconciled to God, Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And the benefit of forgiveness is I can have the victory in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 it just exalts the victory that we have. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then let's notice also that in the book of Acts we have the genesis of the New Testament church, the beginning of the Lord's church. Notice Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. The Bible says they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily. Those are being saved. Isn't it wonderful to hear those words? For the very first time, God added people to His church. 
when they obeyed the gospel. Well, what do we know about this church that we read of in Acts chapter 2? We know when it came into existence. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44, Daniel prophesied in the long ago that in the time of these four kings, God would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. No kingdom is set up by God until Jesus comes on the scene in the Roman era. Mark 9 verse 1, Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here today who will not taste death till they see the kingdom present with power. I know that the kingdom, the church started in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. I know where it started. Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 prophesied that the Lord's church, the Lord's house, would be established in Zion. The church is the house of the living God. 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 and in Acts chapter 2, where are they? They're in Jerusalem. I know who was going to start the church. 2 Samuel 12, uh, 7 verses 12 through 14. God promised to David that one of his seed would sit on the throne of Israel, the kingdom of Israel ever, and he would establish that new kingdom. It's amazing. You open to Matthew chapter 1 and Jesus is of the seed of David. He's the line of the tribe of David and Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But also know how the Lord's church came into existence. It happened because Jesus died on the cross. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the Bible says Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. And so I can know when it began. In the first century, in Acts chapter 2, I can know where it started in Jerusalem. I can know that Jesus himself started it and that he did that by dying on the cross. Now, let's make practical application. Does the church you're a part of, the religious group you're a part of, meet the when, the where, the who, and the how of the New Testament church? Did it start in the first century in the Roman era when the church of the Lord started? Most religious groups today started years after that. Did it start in the right place? Is the where right? Did it start in Jerusalem? Most started in the Americas or in England. Did the right person start the religious group you're a part of? Jesus only built one church. All else were started by men. And did it start by Jesus purchasing the church on the cross? Friend, listen carefully. The religious group you're a part of is very likely started by men and is not in line with what you find in the book of Acts. Here's the question I ask of you. Can you be a part of some church that Jesus didn't build and expect Jesus to come back for that? 1 Corinthians 15 verses 26 through 28 says, Jesus is when he comes is going to receive the kingdom to glory. If you're not in his church, you're not a part of his kingdom, then friend, we say kindly, but we say boldly, you're not going to be with the Father in eternity. Now we don't say that to boast. We say that because we want you to go to heaven and we want you to be a part of the church you read about in the book of Acts. Well, also we see in the book of Acts the genesis of salvation in Jesus Christ. For the very first time, salvation is also now preached in Jesus. Notice Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, that this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only way to salvation, and you can't have salvation outside of Christ. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10, salvation is in Christ. You see, this is what the prophets prophesied of. 1 Peter 1 verse 10, the salvation to come in Christ Jesus. This is today what we are the recipients of. Titus 3 verse 5, we're saved by the mercy of God. We're saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1 verse 16, we're saved by Jesus preparing the way for us and making that sacrifice. Hebrews 2 verse 10, and we're saved by obedience to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for He is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Now here's the question, the great question of Hebrews 2 verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect 
so great a salvation. Friends, salvation is available today in Jesus Christ. You can access that. You can have hold of it, and you can become a child of God. Well, what is it that we're going to escape? We need to escape the wrath of God. Hebrews 10.31 and Hebrews 12.29 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, for our God is a consuming fire. God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 7 verse 11. The Bible says in Mark 9 verse 44 that hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It's a place of eternal punishment. Matthew 25 verse 46. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 10, that Jesus is one day going to be coming in flaming fire to take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, what must I do to be free from sin? I want you to notice Acts chapter 22, verse 16. The scripture says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The scriptures make it abundantly clear that to have salvation in Christ, one must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Now, there are a multitude of people who teach that all you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus and say the sinner's prayer. Such is not the case. You don't even find modern day sinner's prayer in the New Testament. And the only passage that talks about faith alone says in James 2.24, we're not justified by faith alone. You've got to hear the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You must believe in Jesus. John chapter 3 and verse 16. You've got to make that, that good confession. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33. And you must repent of sin in your life. You've got to repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3 verse 19. And then as Jesus said so plainly, so simply, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. And so today we've thought about for a few moments some beginnings in the book of Acts. Is today the day of your beginning? Are you ready to start anew a relationship with God? We hope and pray that you are, and we pray that you'll obey the gospel before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.